This is Professor Ryan Paul, and this is Writing About Literature Part 3, where I'm going to discuss your thesis and argument in a literary analysis. First, let's just start off with a basic review of a thesis statement. What is a thesis statement? This is something that um, you're regularly told that your argumentative, persuasive essays need to have. Um, so what is it? Well, the thesis statement is a statement of the central idea proposition or argument that you're trying to prove. So it tells your reader what you're going to be arguing as well as how you're going to make your argument. And it should also tell your reader why your argument is important, what the significance of your particular interpretation is. But rather than focus on the definition of a thesis statement, let's focus on its function, how a thesis works. It does a few things. So it makes an ar arguable claim. It's making that claim. And that is what you think the text is doing. Uh, it also indicates the reasons and evidence that will support your claim. So how the text accomplishes this meaning, this expression. And it declares the consequences or purpose of your claim why the interpretation that you're making matters. So this is what a thesis does. So I don't want you to worry necessarily about trying to fit all this into one statement, one sentence that accomplishes all this. Although that's possible, what I'm more concerned about is that you make these three moves, you accomplish these three tasks at the beginning of your paper. Even if it takes two or three sentences to state all of these things, that's more important that you are trying to express these ideas and put them out at the start of your paper so that the rest of your argument has a structure, an organization, and a goal. So first let's start off on what makes a good claim, um, a good basic argument. This is the central point that you're making in your essay that everything is going to be organized to support. So a good claim about a literary text is something that must be arguable and provable. That is, it's something that's not just factually based or obvious to the casual reader. It's something that has to be proven. And it must be a claim that's answerable and relevant. It's something that you could plausibly answer through research, through argument. Um, it's not some mysterious question that's beyond the realm of human answering. Um, and it's something that's relevant to the text that you're reading and relevant to what's going on in that text. This is what makes a good claim. It's probably easier to talk about bad claims and to give examples of bad claims for a literary analysis paper. So again, things that are obvious or factual. So simply summarizing the plot, telling us what happens in the story. We already know what happens because we've read it. So that's not something that your reader needs to be told. Simply identifying the presence of figures and images, saying that there are metaphors or images, or even saying that there are images of a certain type is not enough, because all literary works use figurative language. So just saying that it's present isn't enough. You have to say what it means, how it contributes to the overall idea that's communicated by the work. Um, simply describing the characters, setting other details about the, the story or text, Again, these are things that your reader already knows from reading it. This, these are things they could get on their own. Um, and historical facts about the author, the context, anything like that, um, simply reporting them is not enough. Uh, it doesn't make an argument. You would have to make some sort of case as to why these ideas are important. So these are some examples of bad claims that are obvious or factual. So some examples of unanswerable or irrelevant claims. Um, what if claims or other suppositions? That is, if you're imagining things that are not suggested by evidence in the text, don't imagine possible things that could have happened outside of the text, but that aren't referred to. Well, it could be that this person died, or it could be that they feel this way. Is there evidence in the text that supports that interpretation? If not, if it's just something you're bringing in because of your own imagination or your own experience or something that's plausible to you but is not talked about in the text, that is going to be irrelevant and as well as unanswerable. It's not something you can prove. Um, also, suppositions about the author's personal feelings or intentions. Um, 
sometimes you can make conclusions about these things if you have enough evidence, enough texts, but don't try to read the author's mind or psychoanalyze them. Don't try to say, well, obviously this person believes X or Y or thinks this way about a certain class of people or whatever it might be. Because again, you have a very limited amount of evidence to make that judgment. So these are the kinds of things that go too far beyond what you actually have in the text itself. So here are some examples of bad or weak claims. Uh, in the Heart of Darkness, the main character, Marlo, travels through the Congo and is troubled by the savage violence he sees. Uh, that basically just describes the plot that we already know and describes a detail about the character that, again, that we, we know from reading it. So you need to go beyond this and say what is significant about the type of violence he sees or what he believes about it or how it affects him or what is symbolized or represented by this travel, etc., etc. Um, another example, the river merchant's wife expresses herself through the use of natural imagery and metaphors. Again, we know that the images and metaphors are in there. We can see that. Um, and we can pick up on the fact that there's a lot of natural imagery. Just saying that she says these things is just telling us what happens in the text. So you would need to say something about why she's expressing herself in this way or how these particular types of images and metaphors shape her expression or what they reveal about her inner thoughts um, or uh, unspoken motivations. Okonkwo and Things Fall Apart is motivated by pride and anger. Again, a pretty obvious description of the character given to us in the story. So what is important about this? What does this reveal about his culture or his um, experience in that culture? Finally, the river merchant's wife misses her husband who has probably died or has left her for another woman. Uh, those last two things are possible. Certainly that's possible. But do we get any explicit suggestion that these are things that have happened, that she thinks they might have happened? You could perhaps say in the essay that she misses him and these are possibilities that could go in through someone's mind, but that's not the point of the poem. These are not things that are definitely suggested or even implied by the language of the poem. So these are all weaker claims uh, because of the reasons that I've explained on the last couple slides. So what about good claims? What do you need to do? Uh, well, when you're writing a literary analysis, your argument is about the meaning of the text or the what. What is What idea is this text communicating, expressing, evoking in its readers beyond the literal? Um, and this is called the subtext, that is the undertext, the ideas that are evoked by the language but not explicitly stated. Another word for this is theme. Theme even when used by literary critics, can be a very vague, ambiguous term. On the general level, themes are usually related to what we consider big ideas in human life and experience. Things like love, death, hatred, war, conflict, loss, desire, friendship, democracy, tyranny, all the big issues that humans experience, the things that trouble us as individuals and as societies. And any work of literature is going to address multiple themes. Um, and they're often interrelated. So if a story is about war, that's also going to experience, uh, explore death. And if your story is talking about death, that's going to talk about loss. Talking about loss is going to talk about. So there's all sorts of ways in which these themes are interrelated. Because, of course, in human life, in human experience, these issues, these concepts and problems are related to each other. So when you're looking at a literary text, the first thing to do is identify the general themes or topics that are present in the text. What are the big ideas? What are the perennial questions? What are the main problems that seem to be experienced in this text, described in this text, portrayed in this text? And then consider the attitude towards that theme, that issue or problem that's displayed by the narrator, the characters. What are their experience with regards to this idea? How do the characters experience love? What is, in what ways are their lives or their stories involved with the idea of love, for example? How are their lives determined or affected by it? What do they say about this topic? How do they act? What language in the 
text evokes or addresses the topic that you're looking at, what events seem to be involved with that theme of love or whatever it might be. And how does the topic develop and change over the course of the text? Does the basic situation change? If, again, if it's a if you're exploring the theme of love, um, does the love relationship between characters change or develop? Do the way that they feel towards each other change and why? Um, how do their beliefs change? Is our understanding of what love is the same at the end of the story as it was at the beginning? Is it the same for the characters? Is it same for us as the audience? Now, when stating the theme, it's very important that you don't reduce it to a moral or a lesson, such as, this poem teaches us that love conquers all. Shakespeare demonstrates that you should never trust supernatural creatures. This story just goes to show that you should be careful about what you wish for because you just may get it. These are all very cliched st statements, and they're also just very simplistic morals or lessons. So you want to avoid this sort of reduction, this sort of simplification. Instead, you want to talk about not just some simple statement that can be summarized in one sentence, but you want to try to articulate how the theme develops and changes. What is our experience of this idea in reading the text? So instead of love conquers all, love is shown to act as a force that can maintain connections between the speaker and her husband despite the challenges of time and emotional suffering. Notice how much more specific that is, how much more explanatory, and it's specific to this text. Shakespeare's supernatural agents create an overall mood of suspense and mystery, and ultimately they highlight how, despite appearances, trusting another person is always a fraught, dangerous proposition. And again, that's similar to beware of who you trust, but one, it's not a simple cliche, and also, it's not just a statement of a truism or a fact. It's rather a description of an experience, how it feels. It's not trying to teach us what to do, but trying to show us how something feels and what the ex human experiences, experience of that situation is. Uh, the irony of the main character's eventual downfall, despite his many successes, creates an uneasy recognition of the seductive nature of desire and the problems that can ensue when one person pursues desire without any form of restraint. So again, more specific, specific to the story that's being told, and not simply just some moral that could be applied to anything. So you want to keep this in mind. Good literature is never about just teaching a lesson, nor can it be reduced to some simple cliched truth or moral or common sense. Good literature is always about more than that. It's always about exploring the topic, learning more, deepening your perspective. There's never just some simple meaning to a piece of good literature. And so discussing, when you're discussing the theme in a work of literature, a poem, a play, a novel, whatever it might be, you want to avoid cliches and general, gen, generalities. Your theme needs to be specific to the text that you're writing about. So it needs to describe the specific situation that's occurring in the text, but it also has to be communicable to others. It has to be something that your reader can identify with. So that sort of universality. And that's the tricky part, balancing that specificness with this general universality so that it doesn't get reduced into simple morals that really gloss over the complexities and the work that's happening in the literary text. So what are the kinds of arguments that we can make? Uh, we could talk about, for example, undisclosed emotions, desires, or intentions on the part of a speaker or character. Things that are not explicitly stated, but that could be reasonably suggested or implied by the language of the text. And the idea is that your awareness of this undisclosed subtext will change your understanding of what's going on in the story. So for example, although the river merchant's wife explicitly tells her husband that she wishes for him to come home, her language also suggests her deep suffering, suffering that she seems either unable or unwilling to admit to her husband. So this is based on her language, something in the text that suggests an undisclosed part of her 
experience, an undisclosed emotion that transforms what she's saying, gives it another dimension. Now, it'd be going too far, though, to say um, she suffers because she thinks her husband is dead or because she thinks her husband has left her for another woman. It's possible that she thinks those things, but there's no language in the text that suggests that she specifically thinks those ideas. So you don't want to go too far and try to come up with explanations from your own experience or your own knowledge, your own imagination, that don't really have anything to do with the text in front of you. Another type of argument you can make, uh, the unrecognized importance of some element or event or character from the text. Again, it's something that's drawn from the language of the text itself, so you don't want to say, well, what if this other person might have been there, or what if this other thing happened before the text? That could change its meaning. It has to be something that's suggested by the text itself. And again, reevaluating the element changes your understanding of the literal meaning of the text. It gives another dimension to what you're reading. So here's an example. Although there are few women in Conrad's novel, and almost none with a significant amount of dialogue or action, their roles in the narrative and the language used to describe them suggests the importance of women in the colonial enterprise as both victims and beneficiaries. So this is pointing out something obvious about the text. There are few women in the novel, but saying that there is a significant meaning with this element despite its minor presence or perhaps because of its minor presence that there's another meaning that's going on that's hidden underneath the literal story you can also explore how a particular idea or concept or context informs the meaning of the text how it helps you to interpret or understand it so it could be some historical context or information so uh, description of the period in which the text was written or the setting that the text is portraying or the author's life something like that it could be a theory of some sort like psychoanalysis um, or some other idea that helps explain otherwise mysterious or seemingly unimportant or unclear aspects of the text so for example you could say something like the descriptions of Africans in Conrad's novel may strike a modern reader as disturbingly racist. His ideas and language draw on early theories of evolution, just beginning to be developed in his time. By examining these theories, we can understand in greater detail just what sort of differences Conrad and his European audience might have seen between themselves and the inhabitants of their African colonies. And we could even go a little bit further in the final thesis, you would say something like the theories of evolution that Conrad draws on um, help encourage him to see Africans as blah blah blah. You know, he makes some sort of more definite statement of exactly how the theories of evolution affect his interpretation. But here, what we're doing is bringing in this context that helps us to give again another dimension, deeper meaning to some of the events, languages, images that are occurring that are occurring in the literary text. So now moving on to reasons and evidence. We've talked about the what, the claim that you're making. What is it that the text is, is saying or communicating? And then you want to come up with your reasons and evidence. That is, how is the theme communicated to the reader? What are the literary devices and techniques used? And this can be things like figurative language and imagery, formal elements, like if it's a poem, line or rhyme or meter, things like that, plot structure, character development, any element, any aspect of the text can be a piece of evidence to help explain the idea. The most important point here is that you don't just identify it. You don't just say, this is a metaphor, or this is what happens. The plot is structured in this way. You want to explain why that's important. What is the meaning of the metaphor? How does it help us to understand the tenor that's being described more significantly? And how does that communicate whatever your central idea is. Let me also just clarify what exactly we mean by reasons and evidence, what the difference is between these, for the sake of how you structure your argument. The reason is, a reason is an assertion of some fact or idea that supports your claim or thesis. The evidence is the specific data that proves your reason. So let's look at some examples. So here's just a very basic example. We have a claim that we're making because of a reason. 
which is based on evidence. So the claim that we're arguing is we should go inside because what's a reason to go inside? It looks like it will rain. What's the evidence that you have that it looks like it will rain? Those dark clouds. So we've got the specific concrete evidence. We've got the reason that we can infer from that evidence and that compels us to take a certain course of action or believe a certain claim. So now let's look at examples in terms of literary texts. So here's one example. Let's say we take as our thesis the idea that the river merchant's wife feels suffering that she does not openly express to her husband. So that's something that's implied by the text, but obviously not explicitly stated. She doesn't say, I feel suffering that I'm not openly expressing. So this is the argument that we're finding, the meaning that we're finding being communicated by the subtext. So what's a reason that we could use to support that? What's a fact or an assertion that we could make that would support this idea that she feels suffering that she doesn't express? Well, the reason is she frequently makes statements about, physical, about the physical world that project her inner sadness onto external objects. That's the general reason that she's doing it. And so that's something that shows that she's not expressing suffering. She's instead projecting it onto other objects. Now we just need evidence. We need to see her actually doing it. So there are examples from the text, such as the moss is overgrown, the monkeys make sorrowful noise. These are all moments where she's talking about other things and describing them in a negative way that can create the feeling of sadness and her own sadness. It seems to echo the uh, uh, desire and the loss she feels from her husband's absence. So we've got our thesis, we've got a reason, we've got the evidence. Another example, let's go with that argument from Heart of Darkness, that despite their minimal presence in the book, women actually play a crucial role in Conrad's Heart of Darkness. That's our thesis that we're trying to prove. So what are some reasons that could prove that? Well, you, need to, you would need to show them playing an important role uh, having some important effect, even though they're only in the story a little bit. So the reason would be at significant turning points in the plot, female characters repeatedly play an important role in developing the story. So their actions affect the story. Their actions are involved with carrying the plot along. So for example, piece of evidence, Marlowe's aunt is the one who gets him his job. Um, the women who work at the main office, their role, we could also talk about Kurtz is intended, or the um, the native woman who is apparently one of Kurtz's lovers. So these are all bits of evidence. You would of course then need to explain how this shows them playing an important role, what it is that the characters actually do that's significant. Um, but again, we've got our thesis, the claim that we're trying to prove, women are important in the story, a reason why they're important, because they develop the plot, and evidence specific examples of them doing this in the story. So finally, the why. What are the consequences of your argument? Um, presuming that your reader understands your interpretation and agrees with it. So your reader says, yeah, I agree that the wife in The River Merchant's Wife, a letter, experiences suffering that she does not express, that she has these feelings that she can't express to her husband. I agree that women in Conrad's novel although they apparently are very minor characters, actually have a great deal of influence. Why do I care? What's important about that? What does that tell me about the text, the author, the ideas, and so forth? Um, this is really, in many ways, the most difficult part of your argument to articulate. Um, of course, every step is a challenge, but once you've gotten to this point, this is really one of the biggest challenges, at least in my opinion and my own experience. Um, and usually, while this is something you announce in your introduction and it's something that does get addressed in part throughout the, the paper, it's really what you develop in your conclusion. This is um, the takeaway, we might say, uh, that your readers get from the conclusion. How do you end the paper and bring everything together with a nice bow on top for your readers, so to speak? So here are some possible examples. So again, let's take that thesis, the river merchant's wife feels suffering that she does not openly express to her husband. We've gone through, we have our reasons and evidence. Why? What are the consequences of this? 
The, port the poem portrays the difficulty of communicating even within intimate relationships. That's the sort of abstract idea that we can infer, that we can reason out, that we can assume or learn based on what we've read. Another possible why. We are led to consider how we often sublimate our desires, that's another word for suppress, in order to please some other party. So this is something that we're taught, that we experience in reading this text. Another consequence, the particular historical setting of this poem encourages us, encourages us to think about how women have traditionally been unable to express themselves openly and to wonder just how much such things may have changed. So these are all different. These are all possible um, whys that you could articulate in an essay on the River Merchant's Wife, and there are many others. It all, of course, depends on your argument and why you think that's important, what you've gained from the reading. Another example, slightly more complicated perhaps, let's say we've taken as the thesis of our paper that Conrad's depictions of Africans are based in early theories of evolution. We've gone through, we've discussed those early theories, we've pointed out um, comparisons between uh, what Conrad writes and those um, <clears throat> depictions. We've explained how Conrad's ideas are informed by that and so forth. So why? What's important about this? What's the so what of your argument? Um, one possibility could be something like, even though Conrad draws on the modern science of evolution, he still expresses traditionally racist views on Africans. This apparent contradiction forces us to recognize that science is not always progressive and that scientific theories can be used to promote old forms of hatred and discrimination. So that might be the consequence. That might be what you've learned from this text, if that's the argument, if you've made a you know, particular argument about Conrad's views and their racism. Another possible con uh, consequence, Conrad's use of the language of evolution in a story about colonialism highlights how politics popular culture, and scientific discourse are all closely related. Although we often think about these as separate realms, Conrad's novel encourages us to think about how scientific ideas can be misused to support particular agendas, and about how science may also enable us to challenge oppressive forms of politics. So this could be a different sort of consequence, conclusion that you draw from your interpretation of the story and the interplay between scientific language and racism. So again, why? What do we learn? What's important about this interpretation and reinterpreting this text? What do we gain by doing that? So putting it all together. In your introduction, I recommend using what we call the inverted pyramid. So you start with the kind of broad statement or summary of the general topic that you're talking about. You move into some important descriptions, details, definitions. Is there any summary of the story or text that you're writing that might be important? And then as your introduction moves along, you gradually narrow until you get to the thesis itself. This is where you would express your what, how, and why. Remember in the body of the paper, in the paragraphs, you want to use as a framework, um, as a guideline, that pie format. You don't have to follow this super strictly, but again, make sure that you're accomplishing these goals in your paragraphs. You're giving some reason, some point that you're addressing in the paragraph, some idea that supports your thesis. You're providing an illustration of that thesis, evidence from the text that supports your point. And you're not just saying this is in the text, you're explaining what it means. How does the evidence prove your point how does it relate to your overall thesis and claim? And you can review, uh, for example, the uh, Writing About Literature Part 2 lecture that talks in more detail about constructing paragraphs and putting these elements into play in, an, in a literary analysis. And finally, your conclusion. Um, in the conclusion of the paper, you want to briefly restate your thesis but in more sophisticated terms. Now your reader has gone through, they've seen your argument, they've understood your points, so you can state your thesis in a slightly more complicated way, um, and, and in a certain way be a little bit more direct or insistent about it than you were in the introduction. Um, you also want to remind your readers, again, briefly, of what the main reasons behind your argument were. But most importantly in the conclusion, this is where you explore the why, the consequences of your argument 
and why it's important to your audience, what they learn from it, what they can, um, what it encourages them to reflect on or do or think about, how it's affected you, how it's affected your understanding. This doesn't necessarily have to be personally framed, I or, or you, uh, but something that explains why this is important, why we should care about your new interpretation of this poem or novel or play or whatever. So to review, make sure that your thesis tells us what the claim is about the text. What is its meaning? That's what your, your thesis is doing. Um, and it's something that's not obvious and not factual, something that's arguable based on reasoning and evidence from the text. And again, I've one way that we can think about that is in this way that I've broken it down, the what, the how, and the why. What is idea is the text communicating? What is the idea that it's evoking for its readers? And again, you want to avoid cliches, morals, lessons, any sort of simplistic statement that the text means X. Instead, it's a, an idea that the text is exploring rather than telling you some specific message. How does the text communicate this idea? What's the literary devices? What are the elements in the text that support this claim? Um, and you want to explain it. Don't just say this is here, but explain how it works. Unpack the meanings within those literary devices and elements. And finally, why does it communicate this idea? What are the consequences? What's important about it? Why should we care? What do we learn or understand differently about the text, the author, the idea, etc.? So following these guidelines, hopefully this will help to guide you to construct a thoughtful thesis statement that goes beyond just describing the text, but really analyzes and interprets it.